Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, please help me welcome Katie Faro. She uses she, her pronouns. Katie Faro serves as the STI Prevention Specialist for Essential Access Health's STI Prevention Program. In this role, she provides training and technical assistance to health centers on best practices in quality improvement, STI control and treatment, and patient management approaches. Katie also develops partnerships with community-based organizations serving populations highly impacted by syphilis and other sexual transmitted infections. Her previous roles include as a health educator for LA County's Department of Public Health Wellbeing Center program, as a COVID-19 school technical assistance team member in LA County's emergency response, and as a reproductive health specialist at Planned Parenthood, Northern California Eureka location. She holds a Master of Public Health in Community Health Sciences from UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Katie, I'll go ahead and pass them along to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. So uh, early on a Monday morning, we're going to get this week going and just to really try to get into this topic, but I'm so excited to get to connect with all of you because your roles, um, working with families, being parent coaches, you make such a big impact on you know, families and community health and on all of us. So I'm just excited to connect with you on this. And yeah, Jennifer, if we could go ahead and share those slides, we can get things going. Beautiful. And my tons and tons of notes don't look like they're showing, so that's good. Um, Perfect. All right. So we can start from the beginning. Um, today we will be um, talking about sexually transmitted infections during pregnancy. Um, and after this presentation, my goal is for you to be able to you know, have an introduction to STIs. Many of us have some information on STIs, but it's always great to have a refresher on this information and ways we can talk about it with our clients. Um, understand how STIs can affect a pregnancy and how they can affect the baby or fetus. Um, and we will be especially focusing in on recognizing the rising risk of congenital syphilis, which is an STI during pregnancy that can really impact the health of the, of the baby. Um, and we'll also have a lot of information on how STIs can be tested for and treated during pregnancy. All of these impacts are very, very uh, preventable and um, just important to be talking about with clients. So that's part of why I'm so excited to connect with you all today. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. Um, so I am here from Essential Access Health, and our organization champions and promotes quality sexual and reproductive health care for all. We partner with the um, California STD Control Branch and the LA County Division of HIV STD programs to implement best practices in STI prevention in LA County and statewide. And um, we achieve our mission through an umbrella of programs. They include you know, clinic support initiatives, provider training, we have an advanced clinical research arm, um, and we support the delivery of the Title X funded services to meet family planning needs of uninsured and underinsured individuals um, who are low income in California and in Hawaii. Um, so we can go on to our next slide. Just to kind of get us ready for today. Um, your insight is so valuable and I really want to hear your thoughts. So feel free to unmute, um, to raise your hand or use the chat options. I'll be um, asking questions throughout. We will be polling with a site called Mentimeter, which Jennifer let me know that y'all have used before. So um, you'll be able to submit answers anonymously and have them displayed on the screen. Um, and this works on internet browsers or your phone. So if you could just have a um, phone or internet browser near you so you can open that up when the moment comes. Um, we won't be showing any graphic images of STI um, symptoms. It is not your job to uh, diagnose any STIs. So wanted to you know make sure that was clear from the beginning. Um, and some of these topics can be very heavy. Um, so feel free to take breaks as needed. We'll be trying to put a break in the middle. 
Um, we also have a notice on gender neutral language. We really try to use gender neutral language for bodies to be inclusive of trans community members, um, except for when a study or a guideline uses different language, and then we'll use that language so that we can accurately describe, you know, what that finding or study said um, and how it found it. We can go on to our next slide. So we're going to start out just framing our focus on, you know, what is sexual reproductive health? Where does reproductive justice fit into this picture, um, especially for you all as parent coaches and in home visitation programs? Perfect. So we want to kind of frame this in two different terms that you may be familiar with. Um, and here we have the UN's definition of sexual reproductive health. Um, which the UN um, has known, you know, good sexual reproductive health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being in matters relating to the reproductive system. Um, and they've noted that this implies that people are able to have a satisfying and safe sex life, the capacity to reproduce, um, and the freedom to decide if, when, and how often to do so. So this would definitely include preventing sexually transmitted infections. Also, you know, prenatal care, parent coaching definitely is part of this and, um, you know, access to health care. Um, also healthy relationships, communication, pleasure and mental health is all kind of wrapped up in this as well. But the next term really takes things further and thinks about what's missing from this term of sexual reproductive health. Um, and so in 1994, a group of Black women called the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective coined this term of reproductive justice to also address how the idea of reproductive health was really not enough to address the concerns of many um, women of color and trans people of color. Um, because to have a choice without having the resources or power to truly choose, um, you know, like the right to choose when to have a child, but not having equitable, you know, good access to, you know, resources, able to have a healthy pregnancy, freedom from racial profiling or police violence while raising that child, it's just truly not enough. Um, so this kind of thinks more holistically on that. Um, that we want the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. So this is definitely something I think that you all are all working on in your work already. Um, so I'm hoping to keep these in mind for our discussion today and aiming to, you know, give you tools to help clients um, have conversations about STIs during pregnancy and also center their bodily autonomy and justice. Um, great. So we will go into our next, uh, our first Mentimeter. Um, and I will just quickly drop the link also so that you can um, open that up uh, by clicking if you would like. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, kind of get, get our brains going this morning. What reproductive health and justice related topics do you already discuss with clients? So I will go ahead and um, share the screen that has that so you can see it. So you can click through um, the link I dropped in the chat to be able to open this or on any browser, you can go to mentimeter.com and enter this code the 71061099. Um, feel free to drop in the chat if anyone's having any issues um, accessing that. And your responses should show up here when they're ready. Awesome, yeah, child spacing, a lot of information on birth control. Um, I love to see safety in relationships. That's so fundamental to any of this. Um, yeah, those follow-up appointments are so pesky. Um, and pregnancy spacing, definitely. Beautiful. Postpartum. Postpartum healthcare is definitely so key. Yeah, and body autonomy. I'm glad to see folks talking about that already. Um, that we all should have the right to make, you know, decisions and feel safe in our bodies. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. See some, you know, planning on whether someone wants to have more children. And emotional wellness. Beautiful. All right. Well, this gives me a really great picture of what y'all are already thinking on and doing in your work. So thank you so much for um, sharing this and, and thank you for the work you're already doing. And yeah, I think Jennifer, you want to go ahead and share this um, slides again. Oh, and I saw sex after having a baby on there as well. That's definitely an important conversation to have. Perfect. So we can go on to our next slide. Perfect. So we've kind of covered that sexual reproductive health and justice have so many different topics. Um, so I definitely don't want us to be, you know, I don't want anyone to get the idea that uh, STIs are, you know, the most important or the only part of this, but they're definitely very important. And I think I'm going to try to make an argument that they are a reproductive justice issue today as well. Um, and being free from the, you know, being able to, uh, you know, get STI health care is very important. So we'll give an intro. Um, and just in case you've heard, you know, you may have heard uh, sexually transmitted infections or sexually transmitted diseases. Um, in the reproductive health world, we use STI more often just because an infection really speaks more accurately to that there is a bacteria or virus in the body and then it hasn't moved on to a disease state um, and it's slightly less stigmatizing. So that's the term that we use, but um, both are totally useful. Um, we can go on to our next slide. So these are our main most common STIs. Um, so let's see here. These are the major ones. And the most common ones are going to be our bacterial. Well, these are the most common ones that are um, treatable. So chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. These are all STIs that are curable um, if diagnosed with antibiotics. And they're treatable with antibiotics. Um, and if they are left untreated, they can have long-term health impacts. Um, we also have viral STIs, such as HIV, um, HSV, which is the two different herpes viruses, um, hepatitis B is a virus, and HPV, which is actually the most common STI, um, but we really lack uh, ability to test for it in men, um, is the human papillomavirus. These aren't curable, but treatment is available to manage any symptoms. Um, so it's still really important to get tested and get treatment or um, continue medical care. And then also we have some other STIs, trichomoniasis, which is a protozoan, and crabs, which is a pubic lice. Um, and these are both definitely curable with, um, in, with treatment. So these are the major STIs and just want to flag, you know, these are all spread through sexual contact between people um, and they can be spread through oral, vaginal, or anal sex. Um, and a few of them like herpes, HPV, and syphilis can be spread through sustained skin-to-skin -skin contact, usually with a sore or um, another uh, symptom. So not, not shaking hands, not sitting on a toilet seat or anything like that in case clients ever have concerns about that. Um, but just to keep in mind, so most of these are spread through body fluids, some through uh, sustained skin-to-skin -skin contact. All right, and we can go to our next slide. Actually, does anyone have any questions on these before we go into the next one? Feel free to drop in the chat if you have any, you know, questions on any of the STIs we're going over. Um, but I can go ahead and take a look at, um, you know, unfortunately, though we have, we went over that chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. So those key um, bacterial STIs are all very curable, very preventable. They are on a huge rise within the U.S., within California, and within Los Angeles. Um, so this graph shows the rate of infections for these bacterial STIs from 1990 to 2020. 
Um, and, you know, there's always a little lag on reporting data, but, um, you know, definitely the next few years from what we've seen up to 2023, there's still been some significant increases. So the trend is very likely holding while research is going on. Um, so we can see chlamydia really steadily increasing since, um, you know, the mid 2000s, gonorrhea as well. Um, and we can see that syphilis was very, very low, very, um, you know, um, uncommon. We actually almost um, eradicated and stopped having syphilis in the 90s um, and early 2000s. And then we see a major rise beginning, which is um, serious because it can have such serious complications for health. Um, and I just want to address, you know, when we look at 2020, we see that dip in cases. Um, we don't think that that's because we suddenly solved chlamydia. Um, it's very likely related to access to health care in um, the beginning of the pandemic. But there's more research going on about this. But this is all taken from, you know, someone goes to the doctor, they get tested, and then that information is reported to the health department. So that's what this is taken from. Um, so we are, you know, continuing on with trying to address this. Uh, next slide. Um, so why, why do we care so much about these sexually transmitted infections? Um, they can have some serious health complications further down the line. So HPV, which is our most common STI, um, can cause warts, and it also can cause cancers, which is why it's so important for folks to get that regular pap smear and have anything unusual checked out. Um, syphilis can cause permanent damage to the heart, liver, and brain. We'll go over this a bit more later. Um, HIV can, you know, can become AIDS uh, if it's uh, not um, treated and just weaken the immune system and making the body vulnerable to deadly infections. Um, and as we'll go over, a lot of STIs cause serious complications in pregnancy, um, increased risk of miscarriage, and then health problems for exposed newborns. So we can go on. Um, and that's, you know, why it's so important that we talk about STIs with clients, that we um, encourage folks to get tested and let them know that, you know, STI testing is a normal part of prenatal care as well and um, encourage them to get treated, complete treatment, or continue treatment if it's going to be on an ongoing basis, um, because we really want to, you know, address that STIs. You know, having one STI can increase someone's um, vulnerability to getting another one, um, can cause something um, called pelvic inflammatory disease, so long-term pelvic abdominal pain, um, and inability to get pregnant or pregnancy complications. Um, next slide. So we'll quickly go into um, chlamydia and gonorrhea, those two very common bacterial STIs that we took a look at. So, um, you know, as we've covered, they're bacterial, so they're treatable with antibiotics. Um, and one of the key things is to know that most people who have them don't have any signs or symptoms. Um, we always say that the most common symptom of an STI is unfortunately no symptoms. Um, so that's why it's so important to get tested regularly um, and definitely to, you know, kind of continue speaking on this with your clients. We go to our next slide. Um, here we're taking a look at the gonorrhea cases um, and their spread throughout Los Angeles. This was Back in 2019, as I said, data keeps getting, um, you know, it's it will be um, released soon, hopefully. Um, but what's important to note is that there is there were gonorrhea infections all across Los Angeles County where we live, and also that there are major inequalities as to who's exposed to gonorrhea. Um, so this is important to keep in mind that, you know, I think we all know we have major inequalities in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, this actually does not really have to do with people's sexual health behavior. Studies have really found that, um, you know, people's sexual health behavior is um, relatively similar across, uh, across our county, um, but some people are more likely to be exposed, unfortunately. So, um, 
that is why it's so important to get treated. And you can take a look at, you know, where your clinic is at, where you work with clients and just keep in mind, especially if you're in an area that has that darker blue or teal, um, just keeping in mind that this is something quite common that could really be impacting your clients. Um, as I said, it can, um, gonorrhea infections can be quite, you know, unevenly distributed in our society. So taking a look at this, um, which is gonorrhea rates among females by age group and um, race and ethnicity here in LA County in 2019, we can see that younger people are more likely to be impacted, right? We see 15 to 19, 20 to 24, although people of all ages can be impacted. Um, and we also see that, you know, um, Black or African American young women are more likely to be impacted by this STI. Um, and this really has to do with access to health care, with people's social networks, with the compounding impact of discrimination on folks. So this is something that we flag just to really keep in mind how important it is to um, you know, support reproductive justice and also to um, make sure that our clients are getting equitable access to this um, treatment and testing. All right, next slide. Um, chlamydia cases from 2019. This also, we can see some of the same trends holding. Um, you can take a look, think about where your clinic is at. And we can go to our next slide. And um, this is, you know, the same reporting among females by age and race and ethnicity in 2017 for chlamydia. You can also see that, unfortunately, young Latina women are more likely to be impacted by this STI. Um, this is something to keep in mind. And also keeping in mind, you know, when we think about young people, young people often have so many barriers to getting to the doctor, to getting sexual reproductive health care, to... Um, you know, be, being able to have all the information and resources that they need. So also when you're working with young clients, making sure that we're extra doing our due diligence to make sure they have information about um, sexually transmitted infections, about prevention and about treatments. Right. So taking a look a little further into those um, complications that can come with an untreated infection, and this is looking at chlamydia, um, so untreated chlamydia and gonorrhea infections, um, if they're untreated, a certain amount of them, somewhere between 20 to 60%, can become acute pelvic inflammatory, inflammatory disorder, which means that somebody will have symptoms and pain, um, or they could become silent pelvic inflammatory disorder, which means that they're, you know, the infection has moved up. Uh, into the, you know, uterus and fallopian tubes and is causing scarring and inflammation, but someone may not be having symptoms, um, you know, and if somebody is, you know, going through these symptoms of pelvic inflammatory disorder, whether they, they notice those symptoms outwardly or not, um, this can really increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy, of just chronic pelvic pain, and then also infertility. Um, so as we think about that, everyone should have the right to be able to, you know, have a child if they would like to. Um, these are really important to try to prevent and also to try to prevent that, you know, pain and frustration that comes with that. Um, so as we keep this in mind, as we kind of take a look at what different um, strategies we can have to talk with clients about um, STI treatment and prevention. So not to get, you know, too into clinical, but to give a, um, an overview of, you know, we keep saying, I keep saying it's really important to get um, tested. Um, and the CDC has guidelines on how often people should get tested based on um, both, you know, what demographic they're in and that we know, you know, young women under 24, definitely we want an annual screening for chlamydia, an annual screening for gonorrhea. Um, that's the really the minimum is a yearly screening, and um, we want to be screening more often if somebody has any, you know, factors in their life that may make them be at higher risk of getting an STI. 
Um, women over 25 and men, screening is just based on risk. So on people's behaviors and other factors. Um, pregnant women, we really wanna be screening for syphilis, HIV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, hep B and hep C. So definitely always, you know, if your client has any questions, why did they give me an STI test during my, my prenatal visit? This is totally a normal part of uh, prenatal healthcare. It's important to um, really normalize that this is just a general health checkup that should be done for everyone. Um, and also um, for men who have sex with men, we also recommend, or the CDC recommends, I'm not the CDC, um, that they are screened at least once a year for syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and HIV. And this is um, generally for all sexually active persons um, and people who are 13 and older. Um, and folks, everyone should be screened at least once for HIV. So if you're, you know, if one of the members of the families that you work with says, okay, I went and got my STI test and it came back and it does say that I do have an STI. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, you know, these are some general information that you can share with them. Um, you don't have to have this memorized, but I think it's always helpful, you know, definitely make sure that people really fully understand that um, sexually, that chlamydia and gonorrhea are sexually transmitted um, and that this can be through, you know, like we said, oral sex, vaginal sex, or anal sex. Sometimes people aren't aware that people can get STIs from um, other ways of sexual contact other than vaginal sex. Um, you know, we wanna really encourage folks to take their medication properly and fully finish it. Um, very, very important for our antibiotics and making sure those are fully effective and they stay that way. Um, we really want to encourage folks to avoid sexual contact, so not have any kind of sex for seven days after they have completed the uh, medication fully and after their partner or partners have been fully treated. Um, we want to discuss with them, what are the options for getting my partner or partners treated? What, what can I do to try to make sure that happens? It can be a difficult conversation, but it's very important so that folks don't get reinfected. Um, and also just remind folks, you know, to come back for a retest. It's very important for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, there are high rates of reinfection. So we really wanna encourage folks to get retested again in three months. And um, as I shared, there are high rates of reinfection for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we know that if something is untreated, if one of these STIs is untreated, it can cause, you know, pregnancy complications and pelvic inflammatory disease. Unfortunately, reinfection can also increase the risk of these complications. So we, um, you know, really want to make sure people have the information they need in order to be able to know how to prevent reinfection. And if someone does get reinfected, it's quite common. It's important to get tested and screened again. Um, so it's not something that we need to scare people about, but definitely something to make sure they're aware that this is something that can happen. Um, so we know that if someone has a second infection, um, and I believe that this is with chlamydia, um, we have a four times higher risk of that pelvic inflammatory disease and a two times higher risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. And if they have three or more infections of chlamydia or gonorrhea, we have a six times higher risk of pelvic inflammatory disease and a five times higher risk of ectopic pregnancy. Um, so definitely, um, if someone's reinfected, important to get tested and treated as soon as possible also to try to prevent you no know, different impacts on their body um, and also to talk, let them know that this is something that commonly happens. Um, next slide. And so to kind of go a little further into why does reinfection um, happen so often? Why is this such a big part of STI treatment to discuss preventing reinfection? Um, you know, often it can be because someone had sex with a, a partner who was um, not treated or had not fully finished treatment. 
um, you know, very likely that folks, if someone has an STI, that other folks in their sexual network may also have gotten the same STI. Um, also, folks can have sex with a new partner. That can be a way to get an infection as well. And um, having sex too soon after taking the medication, not giving the medication those seven days to fully work. Um, and so these are all important things to make sure clients, you know, have information on preventing, that it's really important to, you know, use condoms and to take the time to have discussions on, you know, STI status and treatment with their partners. But also we want to keep in mind that there are really important power different differentials between, you know, possibly your patient and their partners that not everyone's in a healthy relationship where they can just say, no, I don't want to have sex or I need you to get tested and treated for an STI. Um, and so we know, you know, one of the more extreme forms of that can be intimate partner violence. And also that there's a lot of other socioeconomic factors that come into this with ability to, you know, abstain from sex or practice safe sex. So we always really want to be really empathetic. If this is something somebody is, you know, struggling with or shares that they have concerns about this, um, just really having empathy for folks and sharing that, yeah, this can be very difficult and looking at all the different ways that we can support them. Next slide. Um, so just knowing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, we really, um, you know, the clinician should go ahead and encourage the client to get all, part, all sexual partners from the two months prior to the um, positive test um, treated. And that can be through um, provider referral, which is, you know, um, can be the provider reaching out to the health department to let them know to contact the um, partner. This can be also done anonymously. Um, patient referral, you know, the patient lets their partner or partners know and can even bring them into the clinic as well. That's always a really great way to do it is to have folks have, um, you know, come together for medical visits. Um, and we also have expedited partner therapy or treatment, which is important to know that um, if your client's partner or partner is unable or unlikely to come into the clinic to, you know, get tested and treated on their own, um, it is an option for the provider to provide extra treatment for chlamydia or gonorrhea to the patient, and they can take it to their partner and ask their partner to take it. Um, so this is safe. It's often free. It's covered by Medi-Cal, Family Pact, and um, our agency actually has a program to cover it for folks who are not, um, not able to access those programs. And I believe I've heard it can be given for up to 10 partners. So just keeping in mind that this is an option that you can um, you know, let clients know that they can ask their provider for this if their provider hasn't um, offered it. Next slide. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? I know this has been a lot of information and I'm going to get into some more information and then we, we can do some um, practicing on talking about this with our clients. But yeah, feel free to drop in the chat if there's anything, even that you're wondering or, you know, something a client has asked you that you haven't, um, you know, been totally sure how to answer as well. Okay, perfect. So we can go into syphilis then. Um, so syphilis is one of those bacterial infections. Um, so it is uh, curable with antibiotics and it is one of the ones that can be spread through, um, you know, skin contact for a longer time with an infected area. So this is usually with a sore or a wart-like lesion. Um, often within someone's mouth or within, you know, thighs or that region. Um, so this can be spread also during vaginal, anal, or oral sex, um, or during some, um, a lot of sustained physical contact. There doesn't have to be penetration or exchange of body fluids. Um, and the symptoms can include a painless sore, um, a fever, a rash um, throughout the body or on the palms of the hand or a wart-like lesion. Um, and it's definitely important to note that, um, you know, such as the, the painless sore is usually the first symptom, but often you know, it can be in somewhere that um, 
uh, folks don't see. It can be painless, so they may not notice it. So these are often symptoms that can be, you know, not noticed, or folks can think that it's something else. Um, so that's uh, important to talk with folks about these different symptoms of syphilis as well. And um, yeah, on this slide, um, it's important to note also that syphilis, if it's not treated, can advance through four different stages. So the early stages would be that painless sore, body rash, fever. Um, but some patients, like I said, don't notice these symptoms or, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say some don't have them, but it's, it's hard to know if they don't notice them. Um, latent is the next stage. So after those symptoms go away, usually about a year after the start of the infection, um, the disease goes latent. There's often not very many symptoms, um, although sometimes there can be a rash or um, different warts coming up. So it's just important to know that syphilis goes into this dormant stage and that it's still in the body, even if there's no treatment. Um, it could be progressing on to the next stage. Um, you know, late stage syphilis refers to the really serious effects of long-term infection. So this can include, you know, um, this is usually many years after the initial infection, um, can include organ damage, blindness, um, deafness, um, dementia, and even death. So there's serious neurological impacts of this. Um, so it's just important to keep in mind that this infection is so curable. We almost completely eradicated it so that people wouldn't have to be concerned about it or experience these effects. Um, so it's very important to you know, test and prevent it. Um, and keeping in mind, it's curable, but the nerve and organ damage that can be part of long-term infections is often, unfortunately, um, permanent or needs its own treatment. So that's why we really want to test often and treat early. Next slide. Perfect. Um, and some general key facts about syphilis, and I think some of these really um, apply to chlamydia and gonorrhea as well that really anyone who's sexually active can get an STI like syphilis. And again, that that most common symptom of an STI is no noticeable symptoms. Um, important to always let clients know condoms are great and really great at preventing many infections, especially chlamydia and gonorrhea, um, but they don't prevent all infections. Um, and so syphilis is something that, you know, skin to skin contact can still happen in an area that's not covered by a condom and can spread the infection. Um, important also that clients know that when symptoms go away, the, the um, infection still stays in the body, even though, um, even though there's no symptoms, that treatment's really the only way to clear the body of this infection. Um, and again, always the way to know if someone has an STI is to get tested. Um, and as, as I've covered, um, truly anyone who's sexually active can get an STI like syphilis. Um, but unfortunately, we know that some groups have been more impacted by the increasing rates of syphilis than others. So we can see from this graph, um, which has uh, uh, rates by race and ethnicity from 2010 to 2019, and this is within our own LA County. Um, that Pacific Islander, African American, Native American, and Latino residents have been more likely to test positive for syphilis than our white or other Asian residents. Um, we also know that men who have sex with men have been really impacted by this infection. And, um, you know, these inequalities are due to really complex factors and really in large part um, difficulties accessing quality and consistent health care. Um, which one of those factors I'll go into in the next slide. Um, you may have heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study. Has anyone heard of this before? I see some nods. Um, yeah, it's really important that when we discuss racism and health disparities in syphilis, that we really, you know, put this in its history, put this in what has been going on and is going on in the world. So, this was a very infamous example of medical racism and unethical research practices. 
Um, and this was a research study that was begun in 1932 to study the impacts of untreated syphilis. Um, all of the research participants who um, were, put, were recruited into the study were Black men, um, 399 people, and um, who already had syphilis. They were told that they would be given free medical care in exchange for participating, um, which is something that we all want and that was really um, hard for folks to um, access back then. This was a very big deal, a very big uh, resource and reward. They were not informed that they had syphilis. They were not told the focus of the study. They were actually purposefully, uh, it was hidden from them. And um, they were not told the dangers of the study. Um, and in 1943, when the cure for syphilis became very widely available, which is um, penicillin, it's still what we use today, the providers and researchers purposefully withheld that information um, and the cure from the men so that they could continue to study the effects of syphilis on their bodies, which again, they already had um, a, a cure for. Um, so they continued to do this from uh, 1943 to 1972 when this study was uh, ended by a whistleblower. Um, and to kind of think on just the impact of this study, um, there were 28 participants in 1972 that had reportedly died of syphilis. There were um, 100 um, dead of related complications and at least 40 wives had become infected with syphilis and 19 children had um, contracted this disease at birth. Um, it's hard to fully know the full impact, um, but this you know, had, had, had a huge impact on families and people's lives. It took people's lives from them. Um, since then, you know, laws on consent and ethics, you know, we have review boards for research have been changed to try to prevent this kind of abuse from happening. You know, there's been a government apology and settlement, but I think really for good reason, the mistrust and fear that was created by this study has, um, you know, continued and it has really impacted people's ability to access healthcare, STI and um, treatment for STIs. Um, so this is something, you know, I want you to be able to discuss with your clients, especially when you, um, you know, talk with folks about getting tested for syphilis. This may be something that they have questions on um, and just really validate that this was absolutely uh, a, it goes beyond words how, horrible this study was, and that there are other studies like this that have also impacted people's ability to, um, you know, get medical care at all. Um, next slide. Um, again, you know, as we've seen throughout this um, presentation, we see that there's some differences in, you know, um, uh, STI rates, especially across groups of people of color. And we just really want to remember that, you know, studies in different uh, rates of STIs across rate, race are not explained by behavior differences of the individuals. And this means, you know, and this has been studied extensively that African-American or Latina women who have totally similar lifestyle factors to a white woman are still more likely to be exposed to an STI like syphilis and less likely to receive quality health care to address the infection. Um, so this is, you know, definitely connected with a really um, complicated web of factors. The word cloud that you see is from a, uh, a listening group that we did on congenital syphilis, some of the factors that were connected with the rise of congenital syphilis, which we'll discuss a bit more. Um, and yeah, just considering, you know, keeping structural racism in our minds as a really, um, really the, the root factor of that's causing this, um, having empathy for our clients um, and just keeping in mind all the things that we can all do to try to address this. And um, I, I know that the work that you are all doing has a huge impact on addressing this um, access to health care, to um, quality and caring health care as well. So thank you all for the work that you're doing to address this as well. Um, and, you know, a little bit of a tough transition, but, um, you know, as we think about trying to make sure that people have access to the highest quality health care possible, 
we want to keep in mind the syphilis screening recommendations. Um, and for pregnant people, for those of you who are, you know, working with pregnant folks, um, we really want to make sure that folks are screened at their first prenatal visit, at their third trimester, so 28 to 32 weeks, and in high, um, high rates areas, which LA County is one, we also want to screen at delivery. Um, so keeping that in mind. And for anyone who can become pregnant, we want to make sure that we're screening at least once and then additionally based on risk. It's really best to be able to, um, you know, for somebody to be able to get treated before they become pregnant or to, you know, just know that they don't have an STI before they become pregnant. Um, and then, you know, for other populations, you may, you may have uh, folks in these groups as part of the families that you work with, um, men who have sex with men or men who have sex with men and women um, are recommended to be screened annually and then more often based on risk um, for trans women annually with additional screening based on risk. Um, and for people who have HIV, annually additional screening based on risk. We can go to our next slide. Um, and some of those factors that would prompt more often screening would include, um, you know, for syphilis and for other STIs, a new sex partner or having multiple sex partners. Um, if somebody's sex partner has a known or maybe suspected other partners, um, inconsistent condom use as well. And especially for syphilis, we want to consider substance use disorder, um, recent incarceration, or a partner who has been recently incarcerated. Um, there's a, a high impact of incarceration on somebody's likelihood to be exposed to syphilis. Um, if somebody is experiencing homelessness or unstable housing, um, you know, also rates have been shown to be higher, exchange of sex for money, shelter, other things, um, diagnose of an STI in the last 12 months. So if someone has one STI, unfortunately, they're more likely to also be exposed to another one. And um, anyone with HIV, we definitely want to be making sure to screen more often as well. Um, perfect. Does anyone have any questions again so far? Just want to check in. I'm going to go a little bit more into um, some heavy information before we take a break. Um, so we, we know that syphilis, if it's not treated, it stays within the body um, and can move on to the next stage of infection. But what happens if someone has syphilis or gets syphilis and they become pregnant? Um, so we'll be taking a look at this in the next few slides. So congenital syphilis is when syphilis is transmitted from the pregnant person to the fetus during the pregnancy or delivery. And this can happen um, at any part in the pregnancy um, and in any stage of syphilis. Um, this is called congenital syphilis, which you all likely know working um, in prenatal and with um, parents in, um, in the postpartum period, but um, I needed a refresher when I began working on this issue. Congenital means a condition present from birth. Um, and this is also very curable and very preventable. Um, but next, we'll take a look at some of the effects of congenital syphilis on the baby. Um, so some of those effects can include miscarriage, stillbirth, and infant death. This actually happens in about 40% of cases. Um, also premature birth and low birth weight and some very serious birth defects like um, deformed bones, severe anemia, enlarged liver and spleen, jaundice, um, and then again, that um, blindness, deafness, or meningitis. Um, so these are very serious, serious health issues for, for the fetus, for the baby, and very preventable. We want to make sure that we are testing, um, that folks are getting access to good treatment, um, and being engaged in prenatal care, helping folks stay engaged in prenatal care is really key for this. So you are all very key for preventing this. 
Uh, next slide. And congenital syphilis is very on the rise within Los Angeles County. Um, we can see from 2005 to 2021. Um, and to kind of explain this graph, I know there's a lot going on. The bars are cases among um, females. Um, the light blue is um, females who are not pregnant. The dark blue is females who are pregnant. Um, and then that green line that we see rising is the cases of congenital syphilis. Um, and this is cases not as in, you know, people who were pregnant and who were treated, but cases as in, um, you know, the person who was pregnant um, was not treated or was um, not fully treated or was reinfected. And there was a birth or miscarriage that um, the, the baby had, baby or fetus had um, acquired syphilis. Um, so we can see that this was really low back in 2012 with only six cases. Um, and then we can see in 2021 um, that we had a full 123 um, syphilis cases within LA County. The only year that we haven't seen a rise um, in syphilis cases among females was in 2020. Um, again, related to uh, likely related to healthcare access during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, even as people weren't able to get access to healthcare, people still gave birth and we still did see a rise in um, cases of congenital syphilis. Um, and we, we really show this to show, you know, the, the growth of this as an infection and also to show that it's very important to assist people who are or who could become pregnant to um, get tested and treated as well in order to help prevent um, congenital syphilis cases. Um, and next we're gonna take a look at um, the distribution. Perfect. Um, taking a look at um, how congenital, congenital syphilis cases were spread out throughout Los Angeles County. We again can see that we have some really serious health disparities going on. Um, so this is broken down by spas or service planning areas, um, and this was by number of cases in 2020. Um, and we can see that SPA 6 or South LA um, and SPA 4, 7, and 8, which are Metro, um, East LA, and um, the South Bay area, all had higher numbers of cases. So definitely keeping this in mind as you work with your clients. Um, and also keeping in mind that um, this is based on the number of cases, not on the uh, you know rate. So in areas that have a slightly smaller population, like our Antelope Valley folks, um, there has also been a major rise in Antelope Valley. It's just not as much reflected in this graph because it's do done by overall number of cases instead of um, the rate at which cases are happening among the amount of people. Um, so this is you know, spread throughout Los Angeles. Um, so continue thinking on you know, where you provide your services um, so that you know, you know you're an important part of preventing this as well. All right, so here we're taking a look. You know, we know that this that congenital syphilis is increasing in LA County. So it definitely really begs the question of, well, what do we know about the birthing parents of infants who were exposed to um, diagnosed with congenital syphilis here in Los Angeles? Um, so LA County did a um, case analysis of the cases in 2019, and these are some of the trends that they found. Um, the vast majority, as we can see on the left in the um, pie graph, um, either didn't have prenatal care or started prenatal care late in the pregnancy, or they were um, poorly engaged in prenatal care. So this is so important because, um, you know, we know that prenatal care is where, you know, testing and treatment definitely should be happening. We have those multiple screenings throughout the pregnancy. Um, so the work that you do to engage people in prenatal care and help them stay engaged is a major factor in trying to prevent this. Um, and then trying to understand more about, um, you know, what 
is impacting folks who are going through this is just that there were a lot of really tough competing life challenges, um, such as history of incarceration, can definitely um, disrupt somebody's ability to get health care or be an exposure um, within itself. 40% um, had unstable housing, so saw a really high amount of substance use disorder during pregnancy, with the most common substance used being methamphetamine, um, sometimes in combination with other drugs. Um, we also saw a very high rate of deliveries resulting in um, foster care referral. So um, these are definitely all factors to keep in mind, and we'll take a bit more of a look at you know, how we can address these, how these can be major barriers, how we can support clients as well. Um, so we can take a look. Um, the next slide, going over more, that there is definitely still a racial justice um, angle that's very important to keep in mind. Um, the race of um, congenital syphilis, case parents at birth. Um, we can see, and this was from 2018, that Latina women, African-American folks, and then we see all other um, groups. Um, we see a huge disparity here. And I, again, really want to connect this. You know, we have seen so many different examples of mistreatment within medical care that can make, and different barriers to medical care. Um, we can keep in mind also the forcible sterilization of Latina women here in Los Angeles um, in the 80s and 70s, and just higher rates of maternal mortality for Black women in the U.S. than their peers. Um, and just keeping the mind and connecting these, you know, huge health disparities to, um, you know, the long mistreatment of women of color in the U.S. and um, the necessity to move towards justice for this. So it's really truly not acceptable that women of color and their children are more likely to face the impacts of congenital syphilis. Um, next, we're gonna take a look at some of the barriers to care that folks have reported. Yeah, and we'll be discussing barriers to keep in mind how to support clients. So can go on, perfect. Um, and just wanted to share in the mentee, um, what barriers to sexual and reproductive health care have your clients experienced, or can you imagine that they're experiencing things that they've shared? Um, we'll be sharing some information, you know, that's been found through research, but you all are already working with your clients. I'm sure you're very aware of many of the, um, let me move to the next slide. There we go. I'm sure you are very um, aware of the different, you know, barriers that they're facing and different things that can prevent people from being able to, you know, truly access healthcare. Um, so you can click through the link in the chat or um, you can log in using the code again, which is 71061099 to kind of get a, a, an idea of um, what you are already seeing your clients um, facing. Yeah, language barriers is definitely huge. Um, providers disregarding their concerns, that's very concerning. Um, insurance and yes, having access only to emergency Medi-Cal um, can be a huge issue. Um, so seeing a lot of immigration status um, impacting people's health benefits and health care. Um, let me scroll down here so we can keep seeing what people are sharing. Definitely seeing some common trends on access, um, language and immigration. Yeah, access to appointments, yes, definitely can be a huge issue. Um, and child care, yeah, folks are asked to find their own child care for their medical appointments um, and transportation. Yeah, distrust due to negative experiences, definitely. Um, all it takes is really one instance of, of mistreatment. Um, lack of health education, yeah, I think most of us weren't given a ton of information on this in schools. If you were, that's great. But, um, you know, we know that throughout the U.S., people often don't have much information. Um, seen by RN or not doctor. 
Perfect. All right. So we can go back to our, our slides. Oh. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we can go on to our next slide, which, um, you know, there's been different research that's been done as well. Talking to people who have, um, you know, had a pregnancy impacted by congenital syphilis or who um, have a lot of the factors that are associated and um, they shared some really similar things to what you all have shared as far as um, stigma, um, you know, having other high priority concerns, structural barriers, so access, finance, um, immigration status, and transportation, um, knowledge. We also saw one that was often um, fear of uh, protect, fear of child protective services and of law en enforcement. Um, you know, one thing that we've heard is that people, um, especially if someone's using a substance during pregnancy, there's often a fear that accessing health care will cause for there to be a, you know, report or some kind of criminal charge. So if somebody's in an abusive um, relationship, there's also a fear there. It's important to note that substance use during pregnancy is not a mandated or reason to report. Um, someone um, within California, but um, you know, people have had really tough experiences with this um, and people can avoid healthcare in order to try to protect themselves from criminal charges. Unfortunately, this can really separate them from, um, from the supportive services that can really make an impact on all the factors that can help them to parent. So um, we really want definitely want to keep that in mind as well, that, you know, substance use disorder during pregnancy can be really tough to see and is also really important to connect clients with um, supportive services. All right, so we can go on. We want to think about, you know, um, reframing our language and in the interest of time, I'm just going to move forward a bit, but I do want to, you know, definitely want to flag this, you know, talking about clean for um, STIs or substance use. Um, we definitely wanna you know, not use that language because nobody is clean or dirty because of this and really use you know, precise language to what we mean. Did someone test negative for STIs? Did they have a positive test? Um, you know, keeping things really accurate and avoiding, um, and avoiding you know, language that really uh, places a label or value on the person. Uh, next slide. All right, I am so sorry, folks. I think I'm going to be moving through this break rather quickly, but I want us to take a moment, take a deep breath. If you do need to go grab a coffee or use the restroom, feel free to do so. Just think, you know, I know this has been heavy information today on what is this bringing up for us? What do we feel in our body? Um, so please feel free to grab a coffee and take a moment. Um, I'm going to try to cover the rest of the information, definitely, um, but I, I really want you to make sure that you're taking care of yourself, so feel free to take your time. All right. Um, when it comes to talking with clients about, you know, their pregnancy intentions, we found this is really important for um, helping to engage clients, you know, on their sexual reproductive health and really integrating information about congenital syphilis prevention. Um, so we can go on to our next slide and kind of go over what that can look like. And um, I'm gonna skip this question on how you feel asking clients about their pregnancy intentions, um, but just keep in mind, you know, I'm, I'm imagining many of you are very comfortable because these are conversations you have all the time. If this is a little bit less comfortable for you, that's totally okay. And practice is absolutely um, what's useful here. And we'll be sharing some scripts as well that you can use. Um, definitely for starting this conversation, we always wanna transition into the, con into the topic, um, you know, connect the client's needs um, with sexual and reproductive health. Um, we want to normalize it by saying, you know, I'm asking all of my families that I'm working with about this and truly doing that so that people don't have to wonder, you know, what is it about me that's making me be singled out? 
Um, and you can always acknowledge that this may feel personal and um, share that you're really just trying to provide the best care possible. And if somebody is not comfortable talking about this, they can absolutely um, you know, decline or bring it up later. Um, next slide. Um, I'm gonna mostly screen go over this um, because I think you all are definitely practicing many of these things. Um, definitely want to also give a um, you know when it's talk when we're talking about sexual reproductive health, it's so important to avoid making any kind of assumption um, and making sure that we ask and don't guess about somebody's you know sexual orientation, um, their gender identity, and their behaviors. And one important way to do this can use be using the term like partner instead of boyfriend or girlfriend so that we, you know, avoid assumptions about the gender of somebody's partner um, and also about, you know, their relationship status. Right. Um, go into information on this. Um, it's really important that we rephrase counseling questions to try to, um, you know, use open-ended questions and also to try to make sure that things aren't being stigmatizing. So questions like, do you use condoms every time? Often can, um, you know, just bring up uh, a lot of pressure for somebody to say yes, even if that's not completely um, accurate. And also, um, you know, doesn't give a, a opportunity for the person to share more about what they're going through. So we definitely recommend using open-ended questions and asking folks. Um, and I wanna go over this final question here. Aren't you worried about getting an STI? Um, thinking about how that, you know, that question can feel to be asked. Um, can be really tough to find the language to talk about sexually transmitted infections, but often it's really useful to use those open ended questions and ask, you know, what do you know about sexually transmitted infections? What are you doing to protect yourself from sexually transmitted infections so that um, you can get more information from the client, um, affirm what they're already doing? Most people are trying to do something. Um, and also to have some um, opportunities to ask, can I share some other information with you about, you know, about syphilis or congenital syphilis, how that spread? Um, can I share some information about the importance of testing with you? Um, yeah, so we'll move on to our next slide. Um, we have a script tool that I can definitely share out that has all this information, so you don't need to have it all memorized. Um, and it has information on congenital syphilis, talking to people about their pregnancy intentions. And then it also has a space for you to make referrals where you can put information for contact at your agency. Um, next. So, um, Going into, you know, talking about pregnancy status, and this is definitely, of course, for um, clients who are in that postpartum era, you know, we don't need to ask people about their pregnancy status if we know that they are pregnant, um, but we want to be asking both, and I think, Jennifer, if you could press forward one more time, I think it's got some text that's still... There we go. Um, perfect. We want to ask folks both, you know, this simple question, do you think you would like to have more children in the future? Um, and how important is it for you to prevent pregnancy until then? Um, and also asking folks, you know, um, if they're not pregnant at the time, um, to make sure you know, are you or your partner, could you be pregnant now? Um, so that we can really try to help folks to um, get the resources and information they need to meet their goals and also to connect people into early prenatal care as well um, or into other options if they um, find out they're pregnant and would like to consider adoption or abortion. Those are also options as well. Um, next slide. So in that postpartum period, really wanting to share, um, you know, asking, trying to gauge um, whether somebody is pregnant or not. And I'll just kind of go through this information, I think. Let's see, let's go forward from here. Um, so kind of going into if pregnancy is not desired, what we can share with clients, um, if they share that they're not interested, is just using that 
you know, neutral uh, language, um, let them know that then your goal is to help them avoid pregnancy. You can um, ask if you can share um, contraceptive options. You can share on the risk of congenital syphilis so that folks are aware. Um, you know, encourage folks to get tested, make sure that's part of their prenatal care, um, and also connect them with referral to confidential testing and free contraception and just checking in on what the best way is for someone to access that through the agency that you're working with. Um, next slide. If someone shares that they, you know, a pregnancy is, you know, something that they want, that they desire, you want to let them know that your goal as as always is um, to support a healthy birth and healthy baby. And folks are aware with that. Um, and just emphasize the need for testing, early continued prenatal care, explain those risks of congenital syphilis, that this is an infection on the rise that can impact the health of the pregnancy of the baby, um, and make sure that they have the referral they need for um, testing and treatment. Next slide. And this is information you can talk about with people of all genders because, you know, everyone has a, a role to play in STI prevention. Um, so this is something you can talk about with cisgender men. So this is something that we can talk about with transgender people as well. Um, because partners who cannot get pregnant are very important in congenital syphilis um, prevention. And, you know, you can use the same questions on, you know, are you interested in having another child? How important is it to prevent until then? Um, and, you know, folks' answers can also lead to providing resources like, you know, condoms, access to testing, prenatal care, um, and supporting their partner in um, accessing prenatal care. Perfect. Um, Let's see here. Jennifer, do you think we should go into the role play just real quick? I think it'll give them a good opportunity to um, share their experiences. And I think so for, a for five minutes, maybe. Yeah, perfect. Sounds great. All right. So as we've kind of gone over how to ask these questions um, and integrate this information, we're going to give you a, a chance to um, go ahead and do a practice. Let me grab the one second. I'm going to need to grab the link to this. Or, Jennifer, I know the link is in the slides. It looks like I'm missing the link from my portion. Um, would you be able to copy paste that from that particular slide? You should be in the notes there. All right, so we're gonna give you, to wrap up a really quick um, practice time, we're gonna put you into Zoom rooms very quickly. Are you able to open the, the document? Um, it's sharing as a, picture that's not clickable for me for some reason. Are other folks able to click the link? Should open. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. So we're going to go into our practice. Um, we'll give you a quick five minutes and put you into groups of two to kind of practice asking these questions to clients. So um, you can go ahead and click that Google document and it will open up a um, scenario that you can practice being Casey. Um, so one person will be assigned to be the client. So Casey, it says I can't, let's see here. Hmm, I should be reaching it. Let me copy it back in. Um, so one of you can be Casey and one can be, um, you know, your, your usual role um, and go ahead and go through some of those um, pregnancy intention questions and practice, you know, sharing information on syphilis and STI testing. Um, perfect. The link should, I'm so sorry if the link isn't working. Um, does clicking the one that I dropped in the chat work? No, no it seems that's not working. No, no, okay. okay. 
Unless you want to ask them here um, and just have them participate. I feel like I'll. Okay. All right, y'all. Thanks for hanging in there on this Monday morning. Um, let's try instead. Um, we can just do a practice among us if anybody's willing to. Um, is anyone willing to practice being the person who um, asks the pregnancy intention questions? And um, I can practice being the client. Um, and I'll share the script with you. Anybody want to be that brave volunteer? There has to be someone. <laughs> I'll try. Oh, who was that? This is Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so I'll try. So oh, all right, Carolyn. Hi. Yeah, let me give you the scenario. So in this scenario, um, my name is Casey. Um, I am, um, you know, uh, at eight months postpartum, you're here for a visit with me. I'm excited about getting a new job. Um, and yeah, if you want to go ahead and practice, you know, how would you bring up this information with me? Um, so I would probably start off by asking, you know, after, you know, doing part of the visit and that and making her comfortable and, you know, say, you know, ask her, you know, have you returned to your, you know, OBGYN or your, you know, primary doctor for any follow-up visits or check-ins and see what she says. And then I would probably say any plans for more children in the future or, you know, did you get a chance to discuss any family planning methods that you, mm. you know, might want? Yeah. Um, yeah. And no, I'm, um, as Casey, I could say, you know, yeah, I'm interested in, you know, having a kid and about a, another kid in about a year, but I really want to get a better apartment first. Um, so yeah. I would probably say, well, you know, um, are you aware of, you know, some of the things that we discussed last time, you know, I can resent that information to you. I think it's a good idea to sit down with your um, doctor and you know, discuss where you're at, you know, and what your desires are. And then they would definitely be able to guide you and give you more up-to-date informed, you know, um, information and that considering our discussion last time. And so let's see what she'd say and then just highly really encourage her to follow through. Can I call back in a week or two and see if you've made that appointment? you know, and check in how it went, you know, with you, you know, I'd really love to stay in touch with you and see how that goes through. Oh, I love that follow up. That's so perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that that's perfectly great as far as encouraging someone to connect with their provider. And um, I think also, um, you know, not to add to the work and conversations that you all are already having, but we know that sometimes providers don't talk about sexually transmitted infections with clients, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, always consider giving an extra, you know, you know, it's if you're returning to being sexually active, it's a great idea to get tested for STIs, especially before you have another child, since there's an increase in STIs here in California. And um, they also can affect, impact the health of the pregnancy. You know, what have you heard about that? What have you been doing to try to prevent these? Um, I think that's that's absolutely perfect. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Yeah, I would probably also encourage her um, to, you know, have you thought about, you know, emotional support about this? Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it can stay in our minds and bother us subconsciously. And from time to time, we think about things that we want, like having another baby. I go, I think, you know, there's some great support groups out there for this. And I can definitely, you know, um, get some of that information out to you until you do connect with your doctor. Yes, yes, I think that's absolutely perfect. And um, yeah, keeping that emotional support in mind so that people have the, the capacity to take care of themselves. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Perfect, all right. So um, I think we can just go back to the slides and wrap up on some resources. 
I'm so excited for y'all to connect with clients. And, uh, you know, I hope you can also make sure to be sharing on, you know, this rise in sexually transmitted infections with them, um, making sure that they know that this is important for their overall health and for their, um, the health of their pregnancy. Um, Sorry, give me one second. Okay, okay. good. Thank you so much. Um, so there's, we're going to go over a good, um, some uh, other resources that can be helpful um, to share with clients. I know folks talked about, you know, access to healthcare. It sounds like folks are already working on um, emergency medical as well, which um, I just do want to flag that that definitely should cover congenital syphilis screening and testing since that's part of prenatal care. Um, we'll be covering the family packed program a little bit which is a great program. Um, unfortunately, it's only for people who are not pregnant, um, but it is a healthcare coverage program for people, um, including if they don't have access to other healthcare um, that covers STI testing and birth control. Perfect. And just the notes are showing. Yes, perfect. Um, great. So I loved um, the advocacy that Carolyn was getting ready to do with her client and kind of encouraging them on how to connect with their provider. We want to make sure that when we're connecting um, our clients with healthcare, that we make sure that they know that they can bring any questions or concerns to their provider and that they should have access to the best to, you know, um, really quality healthcare, which means that, you know, Providers should always be willing to answer, what is your privacy or confidentiality policy? How are you going to keep my information about my STI test private um, so that I can have a choice about who I share it with, um, about the cost, mm -hmm. about what tests are recommended, um, and about how and when will I get my results? It's really important that folks are followed up with quickly and that, um, that the client knows how they're going to be contacted as well. Um, next slide. Um, obviously, it's always best if we're connecting folks with a provider that um, that they're able to do, you know, prenatal syphilis testing and birth control methods. It sounds like this is something y'all already have set up. So that's great. Um, a little more on the financial access, you know, this can be such a maze to navigate with clients. Um, but I did want to share. So for clients who are. Um, either, you know, don't have access to Medi-Cal, which could be because of, you know, different immigration or um, other issues. Family Pact is a program that we have within the state of California that covers contraception and STI testing for people who qualify with income, lack of insurance, or high insurance costs, or who have privacy, privacy concerns with their insurance. Like, oh, my um, husband is on my insurance and is going to see the statement. This could be an option for someone to be able to um, get STI testing quickly and privately. Um, and it sounds like y'all are already very connected with Medi-Cal and emergency Medi-Cal, but just knowing also if someone has private insurance that all birth control coverage should be covered without any co-pays as well. So we're really lucky within the state of California to have um, a lot of different funding programs available. Next slide. Um, definitely encourage if anyone does experience any kind of mistreatment to consider different places where you could help the client to report that if they're interested. And these are some of the different um, options. Next slide. Um, to go into some of the resources that we share. And I can have Jennifer share these out in an email. We have different websites as an agency at Essential Access Health that have a birth control finder that mail condoms to young people. Um, next slide. Let's look at the, the next one. We have interactive tools with um, scripts and referrals. Next slide. Um, we have different you know, charts and tools on birth control and contraception. So let us know if you're interested in that. Next slide. Um, Bedsider has a great one as well. And I can link these out in an email. Um, next. Um, different information on emergency contraception as well. So I can link these out so that you have access to this with your clients. Um, next slide. We have different health education materials that are available. So these are definitely things that, um, you know, different pamphlets can be really helpful to make sure that your clients have that information. And these are available in different languages. Next slide. Um, and I also wanted to highlight Talk With Your Kids is a great resource that we have. Um, 
that uh, helps people who have a young person in their life to talk about sexual reproductive health, bodies, development, healthy relationships. This is a website we have in English and Spanish that kind of breaks this down into steps across the um, across different um, age groups of what's you know appropriate and important to share. All right, and we can go through these and share them out. There's different resources that I can share out for getting um, more training or um, health education resources. And we can just go to our final one. I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me today. 